Some of you may already know that I study computer science at university. And if you didn't already know that I was a student, just look at my inconsistent posting schedule and it should become pretty obvious. Being a student means tons of things, but for the most part, it means I get a ton of assignments. Unfortunately for me, most of my assignments are really boring and not exactly video worthy, so I've never been able to make a video on a project I've done for uni before. However, that said, my newest assignment is actually really interesting and we need to create a custom controller for a video game. So I figured why not kill two birds with one stone and create a video while doing my assignment. So what's the plan? My idea is to create a submarine game with a custom submarine style control panel. Not like the controller related to a recent tragedy, but a cool one. The gameplay will be simple. Dive underwater, collect treasure and return to the surface before a one minute timer runs out. Keeping it simple allows more time for polish, bug fixing, and a complete game loop, which for an assignment is better than an overambitious half-finished project. Plus, I've already left this assignment pretty late, so there's that to consider too. For the controller, the plan is to use an Arduino Uno, which is basically just a tiny little computer that you can program to control certain electrical components. It also uses a USB cable to get power and load code, which is obviously pretty important since we need it to work with my computer. I created a quick sketch of exactly how I wanted the controller to look. And then, using a useful resource called Tinkercad, I created a diagram of all the components I would need. This is the Arduino, which is the powerhouse of this controller. The big white cube is the breadboard, and we can use this to connect all of our components to the Arduino. These two things are potentiometers, which essentially act like variable resistors. One will control the submarine's up and down movement, and the other, its rotation. You can imagine these like turning up or down the volume in a car radio. In the middle are these three buttons. I know that one will activate the grabber to collect loot, but I haven't decided what the other two will do yet, but since they come in packs of 30, I figure why not at least use a few of them. Lastly, the radar. I could use a screen for this to show some cool radar graphics, but those are pretty expensive, so instead I'll likely be using LEDs that get brighter as you get nearer to treasure. Hiya, uh, this is Future Hawks here editing this video, and I've just realised that submarines actually use sonar and not radar. Unfortunately, I say radar throughout this entire video, and I refuse to re-record the entire script, so I apologise in advance. Finally, I'll create a nice little casing for all of these components with 3D printing. Since the university has a bunch of printers in the robotics lab, and 3D printing is just a cool and fun thing to do. Plus, rocking up to my lecture and showing off a cardboard box with a bunch of wires in it is kind of lame. I ordered all of the parts I needed online, and then got to work in Unity creating an extremely basic submarine controller. As you can see, we have these two sliders in the inspector, and these will act as the Arduino inputs while we wait for our actual components to come in the mail. If we move them around, you can see how the controller will actually work, and by doing it this way now, it will save me time in the future when I go to translate the Arduino's inputs into the actual game. Before the components actually arrive, however, another important step is to 3D model the casing. Thankfully, everything I ordered has exact measurements and diagrams, so we don't even need to measure them by hand, and we can actually get started before they even arrive in the mail. So, pulling up Autodesk Fusion 360, it's time to get to work on this controller. Using a sketch I did earlier, I started to work on the model. I added spaces to the left and right for my potentiometers. You can see here that one of these is actually going to be a linear potentiometer, which is basically just a slider, and the other one is a rotary potentiometer, like the one from the example earlier. I then created the holes for the LEDs and the buttons, before realizing that I actually need to be able to open this box up to put the components inside. So I pulled up a tutorial to figure out how to create some kind of sliding contraption thing to get into the box. And this is the final 3D model, all sized up and ready to go. So now all I need to do is send this off to the robotics lab to get 3D printing. So, it took a while to actually get 3D printed, but here's the final submarine casing. As you can probably already see, I've jumped the gun a bit here and stuck in all the pieces using some super glue. To be honest with you all, I was planning on recording this whole section as a time lapse, but I had to solder everything in the robotics lab, and with so many people in the room, I got way too embarrassed to pull out my camera. However, there is still the issue of wiring to overcome, as at the moment, we basically have just 101 random wires falling out the bottom of this casing. Before I can get to that, however, you might have noticed this pretty cool desk that I'm using right now. That's right. This video is sponsored by FlexiSpot, who have generously provided me with their incredible adjustable standing desk, specifically the Premium Series E7. And let me tell you, this desk has been a game changer for my work, since sitting at the computer all day making games and videos is pretty brutal on my posture. Before I'd even got the desk, I was worried about assembly. As you'll see in this robotic project, DIY isn't exactly my strong suit. However, setting up this desk was surprisingly easy even though the manual recommended using a drill and getting a friend to help, which are both things that I don't have. Armed with one screwdriver, no friends, and the tools that came with the desk itself, I would say assembly only really took around 20-25 to 25 minutes, and it was ready to go before I'd even started planning where in my room I was going to put it. 
Now let's talk about the desk itself. It features a sleek keypad with an LED display that shows the current height of the desk. You can place this keypad on either the left or right side, depending on your preference, and it allows you to save up to four preset heights, making it effortless to switch between sitting and standing at the touch of a button. The dual motors are both quiet and fast, ensuring smooth transitions between heights. Plus, the desk is extremely stable, which is pretty crucial when you have all of your expensive PC parts on top of it. There are tons of cool bonus features with this desk as well, for example, a little hidden USB port for charging things like your phone, an anti-collision system in case you accidentally leave something under the desk, and a nice cable management tray to keep all of your wires nice and neat. However, by far the most important feature of this desk is that it's just good for you. Standing instead of sitting helps with tons of things, such as bad posture, blood circulation, and back pain, which are all things that I will definitely end up with by the time I'm 30 without this desk. With all that said, I highly recommend giving this desk a go. I'll be adding a link in the description to the desk and the FlexiSpot website if you want to check it out and get one for yourself. With that said, let's get back to the video. Okay, so back to the task at hand, wiring. Now there are a few things to watch out for when wiring certain parts, and unfortunately for me, it's not quite as simple as LEGO since each part has different requirements. I'll use an LED for an example of this. As you can see from this image, LEDs have two metal prongs coming out of them that are known as leads, with one a bit longer than the other. The longer lead here is called the anode, and the shorter lead is the cathode. For the LED to actually light up, power needs to flow from the anode to the cathode, and if you connect it the wrong way around, then you basically just have a glorified piece of coloured plastic. Another thing to watch out for is current. You need to use a resistor to ensure your LEDs don't burn out from having too much current flowing through them. The resistor limits the amount of current that can flow through the LED, protecting it from damage. Finally, because we want to be able to control the brightness of the LEDs, we need to ensure that each LED is connected to one of the ports with a squiggly line next to it. This squiggly line represents a PWM port, which you might be familiar with if you've ever built your own PC, but essentially this allows us to control the amount of power going to the LED. By adjusting the power, we can make the LED brighter or dimmer as needed. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut to all of this wired up, because I imagine this is going to take quite a long time to figure out, and to be honest with you, I'm pretty scared to record it since I know something is definitely going to go terribly wrong. It all went terribly wrong. Okay, so it's now two days later and I'm pretty happy to tell you that everything is working correctly. However, I'm sure you're all very curious as to why wiring took two days. And the honest truth is because I don't tend to think before I do. So, allow me to just give you some rules to live by if you ever try and do something like this yourself. Rule 1. Make sure to test your components actually work when you get them. Rule 2. Don't superglue anything down before Rule 1. Rule 3. Don't let the superglue run down the side of your buttons, completely gluing them in place while also making them impossible to click. And Rule 4. Always have a spare component. I would go into detail on how wrong everything went, but honestly, if I have to think about it again, it might bring me to tears, so I'll give you all the creative liberties to imagine the situations that have unfolded over the last couple of days. Thankfully I'll never have to do it again, and it's back to my comfort zone with some scripting. The first big job here was to create a script for the Arduino. There are two things that the Arduino needs to be able to do. One, it needs to be able to read the inputs from the controller and send them to Unity. And two, it needs to be able to receive some values from Unity and then output those to the LEDs. Using the Arduino IDE program, I whipped up this super basic script. At the top here are all of my variables. These contain each port that the components are connected to. The setup function here does what it says on the tin and make sure all of the buttons and LEDs are ready to go. Finally, we have this loop, which I actually can tell you about. Firstly, we are creating five new variables that simply read the current value slash state of all of the components. As you can see here, we have the two potentiometer variables. These will return values between 0 and 1023, depending on their current state. After those, we then have the three button values, which will either return high or low, which we can interpret as 1 or 0 to determine if the buttons are actually being clicked or not. After reading all of these values, we can then just print out every single value separated by commas. And when we get to our last value, we use a slightly different print, which is a serial.println, which will create a new line at the end of our output. By printing out these values in serial, we can pretty easily get them from inside of Unity and interpret them in a way that makes sense for our game. However, before we move over to Unity, we also need to be able to check if there's any incoming data from Unity for the LEDs. To do this, we need to check if there's any available data. If there is, we can read all of it up to the new line, and then we separate each value by its commas and assign the appropriate LED with that value. This allows us to write any value between 0 and 255 from Unity to the actual controller, where 0 will mean the LED is off and 255 means the LED is at max brightness. With the Arduino code now completed, it's time to do some programming inside of Unity to actually make use of this data. And now, after all that, we can finally test the submarine's movement. And I'm very relieved to say that everything is actually working. 
Unfortunately, we're nowhere near done, as there is still quite a bit to do with the actual game, for example adding water, which is pretty vital for a game about going underwater. We also need to make the game look nice and pretty, we need to add spawning and collecting of treasure, create a score and timer system, and then of course, my least favourite thing to do of all, adding a main menu system. Luckily, we're back in my comfort zone, so let's get to it. To start with, I created a super basic map generator. Basically, all it does is spawn a bunch of vertices using a marching squares algorithm and some Perlin noise. Then I added some pretty water with a custom shader that I made that gets darker the deeper you go. The reason for the darkness was because I decided the middle button would activate some lights in the submarine, which felt like an easy solution for an otherwise useless button. Then I created a little loot manager to spawn loot in the scene and made it so the submarine can collect the loot when it's above it and close by. This adds to a hidden score value which is revealed at the end of the game, and each bit of loot has a random score applied to it at the start of the round. All the loot is spawned randomly around the map, and I made sure to get the LED radar system actually set up to detect where the nearest loot is. As you get closer to the loot, each LED turns on in order, and lurps from super dim to max brightness the closer you are to treasure. I also added a timer that simply counts down from 1 minute, and when it gets below 10 seconds will warn you to rise to the surface. If you make it to the surface in time, you're awarded a score, but otherwise you get this little message that says your score was lost to the sea because you died underwater. Finally, I added a panic mode to the last button that activates a balloon that will pull you up to the surface super quickly. This is really useful in case you ever find yourself deep underwater when the time is getting close to zero. And just like that, the game was basically done. I also added some little bits of extra polish, like a little rain particle system to make the game look nicer and just some general quality of life features. And then it was time for the dreaded main menu. Thankfully, the main menu was actually really easy. I didn't add a settings menu because why would I bother, but I did get to set up the Arduino so that you can click the buttons on the controller to click the in-game buttons. I also added a high score counter to keep track of the best score and finally a little tutorial that runs you through the features of the game which felt pretty important since my controller has no instructions on it. And with that now finished, the game was complete. I completed the rest of the assignment, which was basically just a boring write-up, and handed it in with 12 hours to spare. There were tons of things I would have loved to have added to this game, for example some kind of hazards, some nicer particle effects, and I would have loved to have made it so the controller was a bit more interesting. However, all things considered, it worked out pretty nicely, and I can always come back to the project in the future to add some new features to it. With all that said, here's a final run-through of the game. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you all in the next one.